At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Sacramento is now known as the nation's farm to fork capital. And Good Eats in Sacramento are really nothing new, as our relationship with good eating goes all the way back to John Sutter. For many of us, some of our best memories are the meals we shared in restaurants with family, on our first dates, or even celebrating a special event. The mention of a favorite burger joint or the family's favorite ice cream parlor can bring a secret smile or a shared laugh at the memory of a good time. Sister and brother Mary Ellen and Keith Burns are the authors of Lost Restaurants of Sacramento and join us to share their journey remembering the cafes, the restaurants, and the drive-ins that are an unforgettable part of our history. So what inspired the book? We have been eating out since we moved to Sacramento in 1954. We might not have a lot of money, but we could explore all the places where we grew up on Broadway especially, mm -hmm. from the drive-ins to the Chinese restaurants. Uh, if you've ever been on Broadway, there's just dozens and dozens of restaurants. And our father worked in the um, uh, Jim DeNio's auction, so we used to go out really? there in Roseville. And Keith, it's one of Keith's favorite places, and we eat in restaurants. So we wanted to share the the joy that we had of eating out with others. Uh, and Keith, uh, you guys grew up in New Helvetia. We or? grew up in the brick projects. Before uh -huh. that, we grew up in the wooden projects. So we. The interesting thing. This is off. This is off, off Broadway, Broadway about, in Sacramento. Right. right downtown the, Sacramento. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. the the, uh, the brick projects are still there. And what's interesting about them is because the it was such an interesting mix of peoples that we ate at everyone's house. And so you'd get black food, Mexican food, white food, Korean food. And interesting about that is everybody in the world eats. They may not drink water, huh. but everyone eats. Mm -hmm. And you go somewhere and they say, well, where'd you eat? Instead of what did the Eiffel Tower look like, they, they always mention first, basically, Where'd you eat? You're right. You're or right. Or some of the cultures, the first thing that you say in Chinese culture is, have you eaten? So, so uh, tell us, for who was this book written for? Really, who, who did you I, write I, this for? When we were looking at it, we didn't see it as just a pure nostalgia piece. Mm -hmm. We really thought that there was nothing quite like it in Sacramento. We've long been interested in, in food history in general, but there really wasn't, weren't any stories about the places that we really remembered. So we wanted to be able to connect with people that shared the same kinds of stories and enthusiasms that we did. Well, there's a quote in this book that I've just found fascinating that I just want to share with you. Um, and it, it says here, Samuel Nolan, uh, in an article in Gourmet in 1952, wrote, we remember certain restaurants not because of the food or the taste, kind of goes to your point, Keith, or the ambiance of the room or convenience or any of the other 20 reasons that people list for choosing the place to eat. We remember the places that we have a strong emotional tie to, where we had our first date, proposed to our wife, experienced our first taste of something exotic, we celebrate the moment, not the place, but the place and the moment are intertwined forever. I love that quote. It's one of well, food has one of those interesting, because you taste it, goes into your memory, and you smell the food, you see it. It's one of those things that almost involves every sense. So food becomes the little thing that works so well, because you can have a memory of some place, but food actually gives almost all those memory places and tastes and looks, and it works that well. And to go back to earliest memories, you, you go back all the way to John Sutter, 
Uh, he was the first restaurateur in town. John Early. Sutter John was a Sutter. restaurateur. 1839, 1840. He would, that was a stopping point, literally, for everybody that was coming from the east or from any direction. And that's where you went to eat. So he had bars, saloons, the first, he, a, a, a distillery and uh, restaurants. He was making he fed, liquor, too. Oh, you better believe he was making <laughs> liquor. And well, he had some of the first uh, grape vines oh. in the area. In the area. Uh, and for John Sutter, it wasn't just Sacramento. Hawk Farm, which was right outside of Marysville, was a demonstration agricultural area. So he was developing new strains of, of fruits and vegetables. He has a peach that's named after him. New ways of, of uh, uh, livestock and, and chickens. So he was really a great agriculturalist. And that's where he thought the future of Sacramento was going to be, his ability to be able to take that and then export it someplace else and, and get it down to San Isn't it ironic Israel. that today that's the conversation that <laughs> that's being had today about, oh, we've discovered agriculture. Yeah. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing about that is you could, you could actually use it as from 1839 till now, we've mm -hmm. been farm to fork. Mm -hmm. Hey, there you go, that's true. <laughs> Good so point. so as, as you all were researching this book, I, I, I'm amazed at the, the pictures and the information. How did you extract all this information out of places that some of them have been closed for over half a century? We, we have a lot of luck in Sacramento. We have tremendous archives and libraries. So the Center for Sacramento History has over six million photographs. The Sacramento Bee donated photos to them. Our favorite place to research was actually the Sacramento Public Library. We have really? a big call out to them. The Sacramento Room at the Sacramento Public Library not only has the best collection of books on Sacramento, all the city directories so that you could look at a particular address, all the ads for the old restaurants. But the librarians there have been actually duplicating stories from newspapers from about 1907 on. So you could just walk into the library and say, I'd like to find out more about Coral Reef. And there's a good chance that they could just pull Coral, a file. <laughs> Coral Reef. I have not heard that name in years. Number one. Remind us of what was Coral Reef. The Coral Reef was on Fulton Avenue in a place called Restaurant Row. If you were to survey, and we found it, this was corroborated in our research too, it's the number one place that everybody remembers. Really? Polynesian started in the 50s after the war. Seven rooms, uh, you did banquets there, anniversaries there. It's the one place, uh, very, uh, a lot of places on, on Sundays people would go there. Best pineapple spare ribs, paper-wrapped <laughs> chicken, Cantonese food. In incidentally, that, the pineapple spare ribs, mm -hmm. you've got that recipe in the book, It's in the right? book. Yes. Absolutely, although that's not everyone's favorite. There was actually a barbecued rib that we have not been able to get our hands on the recipe we're still searching for. And, and you know, when people, uh, it's funny, because when people talk about these restaurants that are gone, they, they, remember, they remember the time and place, but they also remember the food, and they're like, Man, nobody makes it like that nobody. anymore. You know, so those recipe collecting recipes, I mean, that's a treasure all in itself. So, so when you guys were researching this book, who were some of the personalities that were the most fascinating to you? So Keith and I were talking about this earlier. We think the most fascinating personalities are the people who came forward who used to work as chefs or as cooks or as servers or were family members. Tell us about some. So do you have any stories you'd like to share specifically? Go ahead, you have <laughs> One of the things is we, we did do a, a, a launch at Time Tested Books, mm -hmm. and we're delighted to say standing room only crowd. The most exciting part is, and I can't remember Augie's last name, but a young man came whose father was the owner of um, Robert's Fish Grotto. And he brought original photos and told stories. And we opened it up for people to be able to share their stories. So we had a waitress that had been at Aldo's restaurant for over 20 years Aldo's. that came through. Mm -hmm. And lots of people that had shared their stories from Maurice Reed. We interviewed over 50 people, and almost all their stories are in the book. And we're continuing to collect them. So we have had um, Aldo Bavera from Aldo's that wants mm -hmm. to now tell their stories. The widow of Machiavelli's, which is one of the finest Italian restaurants that was in right, town, right. want to come forward. So we're still collecting these stories because everybody's got a story of their favorite restaurant or what it was like to be a son or a daughter of somebody who owned one. All right, and as a former employee of the Tower Theater, I just have to, <laughs> have to ask, did you all ever uh, get to the drugstore back when Tower Records was... Oh, yes. I still have memories of the record room. 
I'm five years older than Mary Ellen. Mm -hmm. So I remember going back, taking a record off, going into the little room, playing the record. And Mary Ellen remembers the soda fountain because she would go get ice cream. I can see that you both have different priorities. We that had different, well, what I really liked was the penny candy because uh, uh, Clayton uh, Solomon, who was the owner of it, would. Clayton Solomon, uh, what relation to Russ Solomon? So Russ Solomon's father oh. actually started it. And he had a penny candy counter. And so, you know, usually, and they had wonderful things. I don't remember if he remembers the wax lips and you got penny candy that was on, you know, dots that you could eat. But if you were really flirtatious, even as a five-year-old, he'd give you an extra piece of candy. Really? Now, you know, I've never, I didn't realize that Russ Solomon's father was actually the person that started it. He actually started it. He started it. it. Ah, wow, wow. And that's one of a number of, you know, worldwide phenomenons that came out of this region. Uh, uh, another right. one that you mentioned in the book is A and W root beer. Right. Uh, what's that story? Well, A and W, Sacramento had an interesting collection of root beer stands. There was A and W. A and W was the first. They actually started in Lodi, at uh, close to one of our favorite places. That was at Richland Dairy that was yes. down. And so they started it started there in 1923. But they just had a root beer stand, and, and Sacramento did at that point. There were root beer stands from the 1880s where people would create sarsaparilla or something else. Really? So we were they big just, in root beer. We were root big beer in was root a beer. temperance drink. In fact, that's one of the early advertisements for Hires Root Beer, the temperance drink, because Sacramento, well, California, it was it was one of the most important prohibition states, because people don't realize prohibition started in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. and before the the whole country went prohibition. California was very big. So there was uh, the idea of get people away from liquor. You offer them something without liquor, which was root beer. Because you had all these flavors that theoretically gave people that kick of alcohol, but not the alcohol. Now, it's right. interesting. Uh, a couple months ago, we had Jay Payno from uh, Roostaller. From Roostaller Brewery. Uh, excellent stuff. <laughs> the um, on the show, and I didn't realize what a big beer town this was. So we were a big beer town and a big root beer town. Root beer. We had big breweries here, and uh, yeah. root but beer was very big. The, going back to, to A&W, what we also were was a big franchise area. So what A&W really? did that was different was is that they started a franchise uh, of their root beer. And they had root beer stands, but they started one of the very first drive-ins, probably the second drive-in in the United States from here and then started franchising all across the country. And you know, drive-ins were a big deal here. I mean, Absolutely. we had some beautiful, you know, from an architectural standpoint, some beautiful drive-ins. One of them in your book, Stands. Stands Drive-In. Yeah, uh, just an amazing drive-in. Now that was downtown on the corner of 16th and L? It was 16th, L, and, 16th and L or 16th and K, right. which is one of the, the ones that everybody remembers very iconic. But there was also one in Del Paso Heights. There were five in Sacramento. And you asked what the joy of discovery is. We always assumed that Stan's was a totally Sacramento drive-in. Hmm. He was all up and down California. So there were Stan's in Fresno, Los Angeles, and 25 other places across country. And that's why I said Sacramento was a test market. Keith brought it up. He wanted to franchise and have Stan's go national. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when one of the interesting things that, that you all did in this book, which is unusual, is a lot of times when you talk about history, it's it's very very separate and you talk about this community or that community or the other but you have a chapter in here talking about the most diverse ci city in the world mm -hmm. and how all of these different food types uh, were available but you talk about uh, the Chinese community and the Hong Kong cafe which unfortunately recently closed uh, the Mexican community and sort of like the the tamale phenomenon right uh, the african-american community where clubs like the zanzibar had duke ellington and folks like that who, uh, how, you know your approach on this is very unusual what did it say what did all of those food choices say about our region well we were the most diverse in the very beginning from the days of the gold rush 20, really? 25 percent of everyone who came to sacramento was foreign born and when we mean foreign born outside of the what was then the continental U.S., which wasn't that big. And that diversity remained with us. 
what surprised us is, is that I always made the assumption that the Chinese were one of the first cooks in Sacramento, but it was actually African Americans. Really? So by 1863, the, that's who the stewards were, the cooks in the restaurants. Mm -hmm. So the black population came very yeah. early, and there was waves of of immigration that would be the people who would be behind the scenes in these restaurants. And Keith, you made you made an interesting comment on prejudice and food. What <laughs> what was that? Well. Everyone in the world eats. And the interesting thing about prejudice is, because we were raised in projects, and everyone had the same economic structure, and because you had black people, Mexican people, Asian people, white people, we ate at everyone's place. And one of the things about prejudice is, if you hate a people, you don't eat at the restaurants. So you miss all these wonderful <laughs> tastes. Wonderful taste. Because everyone in the world eats. They may right. not drink water, right. but everyone shares that similarity. Right. Um, you know, there are um, sometimes um, restaurants or lost restaurants are ki kind of like investigating an archaeological site well, or something true. like that. So, for instance, one of the things that has always puzzled me for years driving. Uh, down 80 up to San Francisco is I'd see the sign mm. that said Milk Farm. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not the only one. What was Milk Farm? I thought it was Keith's favorite restaurant, I think. <laughs> well, we would go to a swap meet in Napa uh, almost every weekend. And Milk Farm was a place uh, when we went there in the 50s and 60s, they had uh, a counter and they had scrambled eggs, which were not very good, and bacon, and you went and you got your food. And it was very inexpensive. The, the expensive place was up the road at Nut Tree. That's where the tourists went. That was like almost a, 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 a Sacramento version of Knott's Berry Farm. But the milk farm was for everybody. And great, great fried chicken. Well, yeah. Keith remembers the different kinds of things. So it was around from the 30s. It got very popular when somebody by the name of Duncan Hines, we'll recognize him from the cake mix. Right. But he was one of the first on the road Restaurant yes, recommended critics. by Duncan recommended. Hines. Recommended. So that was one of the places that was recommended by Duncan Hines. It was right outside the town of Dixon and literally made Dixon a tourist destination. And People all across the country would come to the milk is that, farm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I should know this, but is that sign still up or is it? Yeah. The sign is still up. There were actually <clears throat> three signs total. Mm -hmm. One of the signs is in a field not too far from there. So there's the, the sign. And my husband remembers that there was also, because the, it's hey diddle diddle the cow and the fiddle, and he remembers the, uh, a, a third sign being there as well that was on the fence. So there were three signs total and you passed by them. And you just mentioned the, uh, the nut tree. What, what's the story on the nut tree? What happened there? The nut tree had an airport and a large uh, food area and mm -hmm. a tourist shop. So you walked, I mean, it was more for tourists. We went, we went in maybe a couple of times a year maybe that much. He went in a couple times a year. My mother and I used to go a lot. We'd sneak oh, off. Oh, I never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you learn things every day. You learn things. Yeah, my mother and I would do road trips, uh, you know, quite a lot. What happened with the nut tree is why a lot of restaurants close, and that's the original people who owned it mm -hmm. pass on, and it went back to a large family, huge family dispute, and literally could not decide how they were going to move forward and end up selling the land rather than continue the rest. When I was a kid, I used to love to get those little loaves of bread. Those I, were fantastic. I don't know we why had, they tasted so good. But, you know. <laughs> we had the recipe. Not in the book, but I'll get you the recipe for those loaves of bread. <laughs> but it, it's uh, uh, actually yesterday, I was uh, just by happenstance, I was talking with the current owner of the nut tree. Oh. And uh, he was talking about how important it was for him to preserve what was left of the artifacts of these rides oh, and things good. like that. And um, the interesting thing is that um, one of the concepts that was bandied about, it didn't work out, was to actually try to recreate a Knott's Berry-like farm experience right before the recession hit. Oh, God. So, the recession took out a lot of restaurants. It, it, it certainly did. They were going to do the same thing at the milk farm, by really? the way. There were really? investors that had purchased the property who intended on doing the same thing with the, the milk farm as well. And the recession affected a lot of restaurants. Since we started writing this book, we estimate, what, at least 30, at least 30 of our restaurants. Mm -hmm. restaurants have closed that are some of our favorites, some just in the last few months. Really? Like uh, what's closed recently? La Boheme, 
um, has. A lot of the restaurants mm. that were from uh, Midtown. Our favorite, which is in the book, Market Club, which had been around since 1933. That was the little place that was in like an industrial area. It right. was in, well, off of Fifth Street. It was in the old fruit market. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. It looked like an old place, but they had the greatest fried chicken. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful food, but the man who owned it had a heart attack, and they, nobody else wanted to run it. Mm -hmm. And it closed down. And that's the problem. Either rents go up, because what happens is a restaurant goes in, the district either gets very popular or the restaurant gets popular, and the landlord raises the rent, and you can't pay the rent. Ah. And that's one of the reasons. Well, you know, uh, no discussion of uh, old uh, restaurants would be complete without mentioning politics. And you, oh. you all we did a whole chapter. On yeah, politics. and so you know, the watering holes from uh, the Senator Hotel to some of these other places. What what were the ones that really? sort of stuck in your minds. When By the time Posey's we were around, Cottage. Posey's Cottage was probably the number one. Ah, the Derby Club. The Derby, yeah, oh, the Derby the Club. The, mm -hmm. called the Derby Club was? Well, there, there they had were. a Derby restaurant on their sign. The Derby, mm -hmm. there were lunch clubs uh, that would be at every one of the restaurants. So Frank Fats had its, uh, mm -hmm. there was one at, uh, uh, not at Bettles, but it, at, um, some of the other restaurants. So each one had their own. And political lobbyists would get together over lunch and have private meetings. This was before the Political and Reform private Act. Rooms. Oh, that, and private rooms. That, that awful proposition. That awful nine, proposition right. nine that you would go. Antonina's was another place that was mm -hmm. very popular. The Capital to uh, Tamale Cafe mm -hmm. was another. And they would be able to get together. Bettles is one of the most fun ones. It actually closed before we were ever able to uh, go there, but a very influential mm -hmm. type of place. And you would be able to conduct business in a way that you can't today. In fact, I think that if more people ate out in the Senate and the Congress, we would find that solutions to a lot of these really intractable problems would get solved. That's it's how it got solved. It's in ironic Sacramento. you mention that because I read last week that uh, the Senate dining room, that it used to be a popular place where you know the senators would get together in a collegial atmosphere and stop fighting for a while and share a meal. It's virtually empty because yeah, empty now. neither side wants to actually sit down with each other. They're kind of a kind of sad state of affairs, but that really goes to the point uh, that's in this book about the importance of meals and food toward relationships. What, what is it that you think really comes across in this book about that? Well, you know, to, to me, it's food is the one place where you can have common ground, mm -hmm. literally, and that you can talk about almost anything. There were very, around our table, when we were kids growing up, that's where you did your, you know, conversations. It's where you talk about your day. Restaurants uh, and the, the coffee houses, which we don't get to talk about much in, in these places, that's where we go now to connect with your neighbors and other community people. Well, and you share this common kind that of That reminds story. me of like, you know, one of the restaurants you mentioned here that closed was Fuji's. And Fuji's right. was right near the Buddhist church where there's that great festival every year. Right. right. And so, both of those places ended up being a place where all kinds of different people, because everybody went to that, you know, would connect with each other. All it, food, uh, t to me, the, the bazaar, which is 67 or 68 years old now, was most Sacramento's introduction to Japanese food. I'm sure. It started there. A place mm -hmm. like Fuji, the rickshaw, which is also gone, which is one of my favorite places, mm -hmm. that was on 10th Street you know, that are gone. We wouldn't have this profusion of sushi restaurants now if it hadn't been for the festival, literally right. at that church. Uh, what, what is it that's not in here? What got left on the cutting room table <laughs> that should have been Keith, in here? Keith's favorite chapter, <laughs> all you can eat. All you can eat, the smorgie. <laughs> smorgie which is Well, which is interesting because people assume mm -hmm. smorgie is where you pile the plate. Mm -hmm. The truth is original bars, in order to bring people in, they serve lunches, which is a smorgie. And the idea behind them is instead of piling the plate, you select the food. And there was great, I mean, it was Oki Frijoli, which became uh, Ole Frijoli because of whatever, <laughs> prejudice. <laughs> but you had, I mean, uh, there was one over on uh, uh, Arden Fair that I remember because I went. The Whole Food Circus. The Whole Food Circus. Mm -hmm. But there was a smorgie there, and I went to the smorgie. And I, I get a little food on each plate. I went back for the third time, and the owner grabbed my plate and said, no, we think you've had enough. You've come back three times. And I said, no, I'm, you know. So I brought back the 
Sac State football team the next week. Mm -hmm. Forty-five members in the and oh, I, you got your revenge. I, I'm assuming I did well because they closed a few right. weeks after. Well, well, folks, you know maybe there'll be a part two. We hope so. Okay. Well, thank you both. Well, thank you so and, much. And uh, lots of good eating. Um, that's our show. <laughs> and thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KBIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.